good number. So good morning. As I just said, I'm Sasha White. I'm chairing it, the webinar today. And thank you so much for coming and signing up to this webinar, which is going to attempt, as you can see on screen, to give you a comprehensive guide to the latest planning law practice and policy. Um, for your housekeeping, the webinar is going to be an hour and a half and will comprise three presentations and we're going to close with a question and answer. I'm joined by my colleagues Guion Lewis and Kimberly Zia. You will see all three of us at the end at the question and answer session, but we didn't think we'd burden you with our faces till that time. Guion is one of the government's favourite lawyers and is often called upon to defend planning decisions, advising on many Section 288 and 289 challenges. He also has a thriving planning appeals practice and advises on many other areas of public law. And in my opinion, he is a real star and the opinion of many others. Kim joined Chambers last year after a pupillage and is a fabulous young tenant who has a broad range of practice in companies in planning, property and public law. I had her as a junior last November on a case we won and she was absolutely superb. So I hope we've got a nice range in the panel for you this morning. And most of you or some of you will have heard me. I try my best to be a decent planning advocate and as a result have been instructed in over 80 public inquiries in the past five years. In the course of my practice in the recent past, I've also been instructed by 10 planning consultancies, eight of the 10 and nine of the 10 residential developers. So hopefully that will assist me in my presentation in a moment. So we're going to, what we're going to deal with today is the 10 most important cases that have been before the courts, which Guion will lead you through. And then Kim will give a description of what the government was proposing prior to the COVID-19 crisis. And then I'm going to look at the key themes that have become across in the appeals dealing with residential development in the past 12 months. Part two of our webinar, as you can see, it's, this is part one. Part two will take place at the same time next week. So we look forward to seeing you all next week. If those of you that haven't yet registered, the link will be up on the Landmark website later today. In part two, we'll deal with the key decisions of the Secretary of State which will be dealt with by Matthew Fraser. Zach Simons will deal with how planning decisions are being taken currently in the context of COVID-19, and I will complete my talk. On a personal note, can I say how delighted we all are to have you joining us, and thank you so much for taking the time and effort to book in. Can I just make a few housekeeping points? Um, the microphones of the audience are muted so you will not need to adjust your local settings and don't don't worry if you say to your better half please hurry up i wish they'd hurry up you're also very welcome to set us questions on the q a function which is at the bottom of your screen in zoom we will endeavor to answer all the questions at the end at the question and answer session and if we're unable to do so we will follow up after the event with those answers. If your connection is lost at any point during the webinar, do just rejoin the meeting by clicking on the original link once more. Before we finally begin with Guion, could I just say, obviously we are all very conscious of the circumstances in which this webinar is taking place. And we would, we would ask in the gentlest way, if any of you have enjoyed or found the webinar benefit, do feel free on just giving to give a donation to the NHS COVID-19 fund, which is very easy to find because obviously we're all thinking very seriously about the circumstances that face everyone in the current lockdown. So I hope you enjoy the webinar and do email us afterwards with any feedback, both good and bad, as we obviously want this to be as good as possible and we'll seek to improve in any way that you suggest. So, can I then hand over to Guion, who will start with his planning law cases. Well, very good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Guion Lewis. Uh, I'm going to be taking you through my selection of the 10 uh, leading planning cases that have been decided by the courts over the past year or so. 
I've taken as my starting point at January 2019, going right up uh, to the present day, I do stress it's my selection. Different people would choose different cases, but I've tried to pick cases that have a lot of practical significance for those of us who work in planning. And what I aim to do for each case is to pick out for you what I think is the key lesson that we can take away from it. Right, let's get uh, started. I'm going to take you first to the Surrey Hills area of outstanding natural beauty. Let's start uh, by looking at somewhere to uh, cheer us all up while we're stuck indoors. Case number one is Monk Hill Limited and Secretary of State. Uh, planning Court uh, case this about our new and dear friend, paragraph 11 of the NPPF, which sets out, as you all know, the presumption in favour of sustainable development. Now, in this case, the council, Waverley Borough, had refused planning permission for residential development in an area of outstanding natural beauty. The developer appealed, and at the appeal, the council couldn't show that it had a five-year housing land supply. So, as we know, that brings into play paragraph 11D of the framework, which means, in a nutshell, permission should be granted unless one of the two limbs of paragraph 11D is made out. And just to remind you all, we're all familiar with those limbs. The first limb asks, are there any framework policies that provide a clear reason for refusing development because they protect areas or assets of particular importance? Or the second limb, which has come to be known as the tilted balance, would the adverse impacts of granting permission significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits when assessed against the framework policies as a whole. And in the appeal in this case, the inspector concluded that the development would cause harm to the AONB, and he gave that harm considerable weight. So much so that in his judgment, the harm to the AONB provided a clear reason for refusing permission under the first limb of paragraph 11D. And that meant the inspector said that he didn't need to go on to consider the tilted balance in the second limb because the first limb had already disapplied or switched off the presumption in favour of granting permission. Now the planning court upheld that decision. That was the right approach, uh, the judge said. And the really important word in paragraph 11D is that word or, O-R between the first and second limbs. Only one of those limbs needs to apply to switch off the presumption in favour of granting permission. And it's logical, the court said, to go through limb one first before limb two, the tilted balance, because if a development is caught by limb one, which is narrower in scope, uh, i.e. there are framework policies that provide a clear reason for refusing permission, you don't then need to go on to carry out the wider and more complex exercise uh, in uh, limb two of carrying out the tilted balance. So what is the key lesson from uh, uh, this case? Well, the key lesson as I see it is that the lack of a five-year supply does not mean that you automatically carry out the tilted balance in paragraph 11.2d2 of the framework, because if the proposal is caught by the first limb, then the tilted balance falls away and it becomes irrelevant. Now, that might be a surprising uh, conclusion uh, uh, to uh, some of you, but in my view, it's clearly uh, correct. The developer uh, in that case has been given a permission to appeal, but for what it's worth, I do think that that planning court judgment is consistent with the approach that the courts took in earlier cases when they considered the predecessor uh, to paragraph 11, paragraph 14 of the old framework, uh, which, as you'll recall, had a pretty similar, uh, although not uh, identical, uh, structure. Let's leave the Surrey Hills and go to Aylesbury Vale. Case number two is Paul uh, Newman New Homes uh, and the Secretary of State. 
Uh, this was another important case dealing with paragraph 11D of the framework, in particular the first trigger uh, within 11D for the presumption in favour of granting permission. And that's where, and I quote uh, the exact words of the, of the policy, there are no relevant development plan policies. Now what does that mean, that there are no relevant development plan policies? It was an important uh, question in this case. It was another appeal dealing with housing. Although the inspector found that some of the policies most important to deciding the application were out of date, he honed in on one quite high level policy dealing with the impact of the proposal on the character and appearance of the area. And he concluded that the proposal breached it. And he really, elevated this one general policy in his analysis. He said it was up to date, it was relevant, and on that basis he said that paragraph 11d wasn't even engaged. I don't even need to get into the tilted balance, the inspector said, uh, because I've got this up-to-date relevant policy on character and appearance, which is a key policy to decide the case. Now the question for the court then is what do we mean by relevant? Does the plan need to include a policy dealing with our specific type of development for there to be a relevant policy in the plan? Or can a general policy dealing with some pretty standard stuff such as impact on character and appearance or say residential amenity, can that be enough to provide a relevant policy? Well, the answer is that the threshold is really very low indeed. The court said, if you have just one relevant policy in the development plan, then you can't say that for the purpose of paragraph 11D, that there are no relevant development plan policies. Relevant, said the court, requires no more than it had, and I quote, some real role in the determination. And because that word relevant isn't further defined or qualified, in any way in paragraph 11, the court couldn't really do anything other than confirm that the threshold for a relevant policy uh, must be low. And the court was entirely content that the character and appearance policy, you know the type of policy, that it had met that low uh, test in uh, this case. So what's the key lesson from this case? Well, the words where there are no relevant development po plan policies in paragraph 11d uh, are of really limited uh, practical significance. It's really difficult in my view to think of any case in which you wouldn't have a single development plan policy that's relevant to the application in some way. So generally it's best avoided in my view as a basis for decision making. It's not clear if the government intended that outcome. If it didn't, uh, then on the basis of that judgment it will need to define more carefully in the next version of the framework what it means by a relevant policy. Case number three, let's go to the village of, of Bleen in Kent. The next two cases are about the interpretation of development plan policies. First up is Canterbury City Council and the Secretary of State, another housing case this but the particular issue here, and it comes up quite often in practice, what's the correct approach to take to policies that are worded in a permissive rather than a restrictive way? So to give a simple example, if you've got a policy, a development plan policy, which positively supports putting housing on site A and site B, do you then breach that policy if you propose housing for site C even though the policy doesn't say in terms that you can't put housing on site C. Well, the inspector had that sort of dilemma in this case. He had some saved local plan policies uh, uh, that he had to consider. They supported the uh, residential development in some defined locations, but the appeal site uh, wasn't one of them. Never mind, uh, uh, the inspector said, I'm still going to allow the appeal because not complying with policies that are permissively worded doesn't amount to conflict with the development plan. 
Now, the council wasn't happy with that reasoning. It challenged the decision and it was successful in the High Court and on appeal. And the reasoning of the court uh, was that when you looked at the permissive policies in the context of the saved local plan policies as a whole, although they were positively and permissively worded, they were part, uh, said the court, of a, and I quote, a comprehensive local plan strategy for housing development that left out none of the locations where such development should occur. So the fact that the policies were worded permissively didn't actually mean in the end that they were without any restrictive effect. So the key lesson from that case is this, the fact that a policy is worded in permissive terms doesn't rule it out from playing an important and possibly even a decisive role on that ultimate question of whether the proposal conflicts with the development plan as a whole. What's important is how that policy fits into the overall housing strategy of the plan, and in particular, whether the plan leaves space for additional housing sites to be approved on an ad hoc basis, or whether it really is an attempt at, to identify all housing sites required for the plan at period. Now, case number four follows on quite neatly from case three, one of my cases, this, it's another case dealing with permissive policies in a development plan, this time a neighborhood plan. And it's a reminder, an important reminder, that each case turns on the particular plan you're uh, dealing with. Uh, we're now in Chichester district, the village of Southbourne to be exact. The uh, developer had applied at, for planning permission for over 30 houses outside the settlement boundary of uh, that uh, village. And the council refused it. Council said that the proposal conflicted with the neighborhood plan uh, for the area, which had expanded the settlement boundary to include new housing sites, but not including uh, the appeal site, which had been specifically ruled out as a housing site when the neighborhood plan was prepared. Now the inspector allowed the appeal, he said that while the development conflicted with the aims of the neighbourhood plan in terms of where housing should go, it wasn't contrary to its policies because those policies were permissively worded and they didn't seek to control housing beyond the new settlement boundary as that was left to be controlled still by the local plan. And the council challenged that decision, but the challenge was unsuccessful both in the High Court and the Court of Appeal. Yes. Uh, the Court of Appeal said a proposal can conflict with a development plan, even if it doesn't uh, conflict uh, with any specific policies, if it's manifestly, and I'm quoting the court here, if it's manifestly incompatible with the relevant strategy. Um, see, for example, the uh, Canterbury case that we've just looked at, case number three. But that's not this case, the Court of Appeal said, because here, You've got a comprehensive strategy, yes, but it's split. It's split uh, between the uh, local plan and the neighborhood plan, with the local plan, not the neighborhood plan, dealing with proposals for housing outside the settlement boundary. So the inspector was within his right, uh, the court said, to say that the proposal didn't conflict with neighborhood plan policies. So the key lesson from this case, and it reinforces the key lesson that we took from case three, when you're considering this question of conflict with a plan, look at the plan as a whole. And if you've got more than one plan in the development plan, so for example, if you've got a local plan and a neighborhood plan, consider how they relate to each other, acknowledging that perhaps that it's unlikely in that setup that either the local plan or the neighborhood plan alone uh, will set out a comprehensive strategy for housing. It's a question of the two working together. And what that means practically is that any permissive policies in one of the plans, when you've got more than one plan document, are less likely to have a restrictive effect in the end because there may be policies in the other 
plan document or documents that are relevant and could provide a basis uh, 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 for uh, decision making. Case number five, let's shift a gear. Let's deal with some uh, uh, retail. We've uh, had quite a bit of housing for now. Uh, this is DIY retail to be precise and that biggest of planning cases, how often have we all had to deal with, with this question? Uh, applications under section 73 of the Town and Country Planning Act uh, of 1990. Uh, these are applications, of course, which almost everyone refers to as applications to vary a condition on a planning permission, even though, strictly speaking, there's no variation as such because the original planning permission remains intact. You just get a new permission with different uh, conditions. But anyway, that's for the anoraks. Why, why am I telling you about uh, this Supreme Court case of Lambeth Council and the Secretary of State, which was about a home base store in Streatham. Uh, well, this case was an important lesson in how far the court was prepared to go to save the council's blushes after it made a mistake when deciding a Section 73 application uh, relating to uh, that home base. So just to fill you in a bit on the background, and it's on the, uh, on the screen, in 2010, the planning permission was granted for a DIY retail store on the site, subject to the usual uh, condition uh, preventing the store from selling any food. Now, four years later, an application was made to increase the types of goods that the uh, DIY store could sell, but they still weren't seeking to sell any food. Now, the council granted that application, but in the decision notice, uh, there was an oversight. The council failed to repeat in that decision notice the condition on the 2010 permission that prevented uh, food sales. And the owner of the site, upon reading that notice, thought that uh, Christmas had come early. It applied to the council for a certificate confirming that there was now no restriction on the goods it could sell and it could even sell food. Um, now, the council didn't grant the certificate, but the inspector did on appeal. And the Court of Appeal, first of all, upheld that decision, basically telling the council, tough luck, you failed to impose the express condition that you would have uh, 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 would have been required to prevent food sales. So you're now stuck with that mistake, unless of course you revoke the, the decision notice at, at some cost. But luckily for the council, the Supreme Court uh, came to its rescue. The Supreme Court said that the decision notice, the Supreme Court took a, a much more practical approach, you could say, said the decision notice on the section 73 had to be read as a whole, with a focus on what the reasonable reader would make of it. And the reasonable reader, said the court, would take that decision notice at face value, would see that it described itself as doing no more than approving a variation of a condition. And the court on that basis was prepared to read the description of the approved use in the notice, limiting the goods that could be sold to non-food goods only, as if it were itself a condition. That was appropriate in this case at the court because it gave effect to the council's intention uh, when issuing the notice and also the developer's intention when making the application. Nothing that suggested to the court that there was an intention on the part of anyone to lift the restriction on food sales. So the court was prepared to conclude that it still uh, applied. So the key lesson uh, to take from this uh, case. Uh, is this, that the reasonable reader test creates space for inspectors and judges to be more forgiving of errors and oversights uh, made uh, when Section 73 uh, applications are decided. And let's be honest, they're pretty fertile territory for uh, uh, mistakes being made. So parties should be slow in the light of this judgment to rush to the conclusion that a technical or an uh, administrative mishap when deciding that a Section 73 application is fatal. But belt and braces, uh, the better approach when dealing with Section 73 applications is still, if you grant the application, to carry over and restate in the decision notice all of the conditions from the original permission that are still intended to apply. Drawing on my own practice, it is still quite remarkable
how often that advice isn't followed. And Section 73 decision notices are issued referring only to the particular condition that was the subject of the application. Now, that's a risk that you just don't need to uh, run. So don't be slow <laughs> to hit those copy and paste buttons when you're dealing with a Section 73 application, because it could save you some hassle down the line. Case six, well, I couldn't choose 10 cases without at least one of them <laughs> relating to my uh, native Wales. Now, sadly, it's not a, a case that, that puts Wales in any particularly uh, great light because the case I've chosen is a textbook case in how not to deal, I'm afraid, with a Section 73 application. Planning permission here had been granted for two wind turbines. The description of the development approved in the planning permission referred to the turbines, and I quote, as having a tip height of up to 100 meters. Now, there was also a condition which required the development to comply with plans showing that height of 100 meters. Now, the misguided developer put in a Section 73 application to vary the condition relating to the plans to allow a bigger turbine, 125 meters in height. Now, alarm bells should have sounded straight away when that came before an inspector, given that a Section 73 application can't be used, of course, to obtain permission through the back door for a materially different development. But the inspector nevertheless granted uh, that Section 73 application. And in doing so, she tried to overcome that pesky reference to the tip height of 100 uh, at meters in the description of the development approved in the original permission by simply deleting them in the description of the development approved under the section 73 and unsurprisingly the court of appeal quashed the inspector's decision and the key lesson uh, from that case is that the purpose of section 73 really is more limited than it's often assumed to be in practice it's not a legitimate way of obtaining permission for a bigger development or let's say in a housing case of getting an increase in the number of units, it should only be used to remove or to vary a condition within the parameters of the description of the development approved in the original permission. So if someone tries to use Section 73 in a way that would in substance change the description of what's been approved, that application that should simply be refused. Um, that's enough of Section 73, I think, for anyone for one morning. But let's stick with wind turbines for case number seven. And this is a really interesting case about what is and what isn't a relevant planning consideration. It's a reminder again that courts will intervene and they will quash a planning permission if there's a concern that the planning permission might have been bought or will be perceived to have been bought because the applicant offered money or some other benefit that had no real connection with planning. Now, in this case, planning permission was granted for a wind turbine. In the planning application, the developer had promised to give 4% of the turnover of the turbine to charity, a local uh, community fund. And the council took account of that promise in the decision to grant planning permission. And all the courts uh, which looked at this, all the way up to the Supreme Court, agreed that the planning permission should be quashed. Lord Sales in the Supreme Court saying that a consideration is a relevant planning consideration if, surprise, surprise, it's relevant to the development that you're considering. And a promise to fund general community benefits that have nothing to do with the impacts of the proposed development doesn't, he said, have a sufficient connection with the development to make it material in planning terms. So key lesson from case number seven, Planning is not about weighing up benefits and disadvantages in some sort of loose general sense. It's got to be a balancing of matters that are relevant to planning and the impacts of the development that you're considering. And if you're not sure on which side of the line a particular benefit falls, then seek legal advice. And that cuts both ways, just as decision makers need to be skeptical about claimed benefits that don't really have anything to do with planning, so developers should be skeptical about possible demands from decision makers that developers do or give something that shouldn't be relevant to the planning assessment. Case eight takes us back to Surrey, to Elmbridge Borough Council, 
an unusual but really useful judgment on how you should deal with the planning judgments made in a quashed decision if you're later deciding an application for the same or similar development on that site. And you'll understand what I mean by that uh, when I tell you about uh, the facts of this case. Here the council granted planning permission for a sports stadium in the green belt, even though it had concluded that the openness of the green belt would be harmed by it. And the High Court quashed at that at permission. A planning application was then made for a very similar scheme. It wasn't identical, but it was very similar to the scheme that was the subject of the quashed decision. But this time the council concluded that the proposal wouldn't harm openness. Council perhaps wanting uh, an easier ride with the analysis the second time round. Now that was of course difficult to reconcile with the judgment reached on the first scheme, but the, the question that came before the court uh, was this, was that first planning judgment on openness one that the council had to grapple with in the interest of consistency when determining the second application, or could the council just set that whole judgment aside because the decision had been quashed? And the planning court gave very useful guidance on this. Yes, it said the formal legal decision is that a quashed uh, uh, decision, a uh, decision quashed by the courts, no longer has any legal effect. But that doesn't mean that the judgments and the reasoning reached in that decision are necessarily wholly uh, irrelevant. The question, and it's ultimately a classic public law question, would it be irrational or unreasonable not to take a previous planning judgment into account, especially if that judgment wasn't infected by the error that led to the quashing? And that's a question to be asked on a case-by-case -case basis. So the key lesson from that case, it's not safe to assume just because a decision has been quashed that you can set aside and ignore all of the planning judgments that inform that decision. It's a question of understanding why that decision was quashed and identifying those parts of the previous planning analysis that weren't impugned by the court. So as a rule of thumb, the more a decision maker is seeking to depart from a previous planning judgment that wasn't impugned when the court quashed the, the, uh, uh, the first decision, then the more the court is likely to require by way of uh, a rational explanation for departing from that first uh, judgment. Case number nine has definitely earned its place in the <laughs> top 10 on the facts alone. Here we had a catalogue of misfortunes, uh, which meant that the High Court uh, 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 challenge to an appeal decision was issued late after the strict six week time limit. The poor claimant had not only missed his train to court on the deadline day, um, he then mistyped the email address of the agent he then instructed to issue the claim on his behalf, which meant that the agent was also delayed the agent didn't get to court until close to closing time at 4.30. Uh, and then in a, in a further embarrassment, he was refused entry to the court building by security. The claimant then turned up himself at court the next day, one day after the deadline, but used the wrong form. So the claim wasn't issued with the correct form until the next working day, that was the 29th of March, six calendar days after the deadline day. And the Court of Appeal, perhaps unsurprisingly, reinforced the strictness of that six week uh, time limit. The exceptions to it are very narrow indeed. And yes, there can be a limited extension when the court office is closed on deadline day, uh, uh, but that really is intended to deal only with closures that are beyond a claimant's uh, control. The court so no, so, saw no reason uh, to relax that principle uh, to enable claimants to issue a claim late if they'd suffered a particular misfortune. Uh, that would lead, said the court, to a principle of very uncertain scope when Parliament had clearly intended the rule to be simple and uh, strict. So the key lesson, don't wait until the last day to issue a Section 288 challenge unless it's absolutely unavoidable. And if you do, allow plenty of time for court security procedures. How often have we been caught up by those? Um, assuming, of course, that the process of issuing claims in person does resume after the uh, current uh, pandemic. And finally, I couldn't leave uh, this top at 10 without referring to the judgment that's probably had more media attention than any other so far this year in 2020. And that's the Court of Appeal judgment relating to the third runway at Heathrow. I'm including it not because I agree with that media hype, but because the judgment was in fact much more limited in scope than was reported by some outlets. 
the case related to the uh, UK government's airport's national policy statement, that statement had designated a third runway at Heathrow as the government's preferred scheme for meeting the need for airport, airport capacity in South East England. And that option was chosen over the alternative option of the second runway at Gatwick. And several challenges were brought to that um, controversial decision by several organisations. Plan B Earth was just one of them. But I'm going to focus here on the one ground that succeeded in the Court of Appeal. And that related to the Secretary of State's failure to take into account the UK government's climate change commitments under the 2015 Paris Agreement when it adopted the policy statement and opted for that third runway. Now, some newspapers and even some reputable newspapers, it has to be said, describe this as some sort of watershed case in which the court uh, was showing its teeth in the face of the climate emergency. I think the truth of the matter is, is more prosaic than that. In reality, it seems to me this was a pretty orthodox judgment in which the court uh, uh, simply gave effect to the government's specific statutory duty under the Planning Act of 2008 to include an explanation in national policy statements of how it had taken account of its own policies on climate change in formulating that statement. Secretary of State accepted that that hadn't been done, so the court's conclusion that there, there had been a material failure uh, wasn't really surprising at all, it seems to me. So what's the key lesson from this last case? Well, does that judgment mean, as was reported, that decision makers are now more likely than they were previously to refuse planning permission on climate change grounds? No, they're not, in my view, because the judgment, as I say, turned on a particular statutory duty in the particular context of national policy state statements under the 2008 Act. And the headlines, I think, were overblown. So everyone, that uh, concludes my review of the uh, top 10 cases, uh, as I see it uh, from the last year or so. I hope that was helpful. I'll be very happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. But for now, I hand over to my colleague, uh, Kim Zia. Thank you very much, Guion. Um, I hope everybody can hear me and good morning and thank you for joining us. Um, so it might seem a little strange to be talking about reforms um, now, which feel like they were made or proposed in a different world to that which we're currently living in. Um, however, it's our view, those of us giving the talk today, that actually once it's safe to lift the current restrictions on normal life, the best way for the government to kickstart the economy again is going to be to liberalise the planning system and to enable development to get, that, to get the econ economy going. Um, and in fact, just last week, uh, we had Tom Copley, who's the Deputy Mayor for Housing in London, pledge to get London building at pace and scale once it's safe to do so. Um, so how can this be done at a national level? Well, we've got some seeds that have been sown in this planning for the future policy document that I'm going to be talking you through today. Um, so this talk is going to be covering, first of all, the context of the planning for the future document itself, then a, an overview of the content of that document, some of the reforms that are proposed in it, and some insight from a talk given by Simon Gallagher, Director of Planning at MHCRG, just yesterday on what happens next. So turning now to the context uh, for this document. Well, the document was, well, it started with the budget, which was announced only a month ago, but it might seem like somewhat a lifetime ago now, uh, back on the 11th of March of this year. Um, and that budget included an announcement for new funding for various planning related purposes. Um, and these included an extension of the affordable homes program, um, over a billion pounds of allocations from the housing infrastructure fund, and nearly 650 million pounds of funding to help rough sleepers into permanent accommodation. Um, and then on the 12th of March, so just the next day, the government published the Pub Planning for the Future document, which is supposed to set out the government's plans for house building and tackling rough sleeping in more detail. A whole 11 pages of detail, that is. So uh, let's have a look at what, that, what exactly that covers. Um, so the content um, I've sort of divided up as follows. Um, the document itself is divided into five sections. Um, firstly, supporting communities to deliver more homes for local people. Second, helping first-time buyers onto the housing ladder, then creating beautiful and sustainable places, then ensuring house affordable, safe and secure housing for all, 
And finally, laying the foundations for affordable, green and beautiful homes for everyone, which is essentially just a concluding section of a document. Um, and looking through those sections, three themes really stood out to me. Uh, the first was this, the focus on home ownership. Uh, this is not a good document for the build to rent sector. It's really more about building homes that people can live, that can own, um, especially first time buyers. Uh, the second theme is that there's a lot of focus around faster de decision making to drive that development and that decision making needs to be more efficient and needs to be making more use of technology. Um, and this was really something that was emphasised by Simon Gallagher in his talk yesterday um, and that I'll come back to towards the end of this talk. Um, and finally, the drive for development does not mean compromising on beautiful design and sustainability. They really like the word beauty, it comes up a lot in this document um, and responding to the building uh, beautiful report is something that, that is mentioned and we'll come on to a bit later on. Um, and then finally, there's one real criticism, I think, that seems a bit summed up relatively early on in the paper, uh, which is that the planning process is complex, out of date and fails to deliver enough homes where they're needed. So this is really something that the document is trying to, and the reform set out in the document is trying to remedy. Um, and the current crisis will certainly have been a big wake up call in this regard and is going to have to force the planning system to embrace technological solutions and more modern ways of doing things, which hopefully provide a legacy for the future. Um, so we're now going to move on to some of the reforms that are set out in the paper. Um, and as I was reading this, um, a quote from Napoleon Bonaparte came to mind, which is that if you wish to be success in the world, promise everything and deliver nothing. Um, and it might be a bit unfair to say that this is the strategy that Robert Jenrick has adopted here, but there are certainly a lot of promises made in this document and not a huge amount in terms of concrete timeframes for delivery. Um, it's also arguable that many of these reforms are not very groundbreaking or innovative, um, but I'm going to try and pick out some of the firmer pledges set out, um, starting with, um, as we all love, the promise of some more policy documents um, and some more promises. Um, so here's um, the series of major publications that the Planning for the Future document says that are going, are going to be appearing some, within the next year. Um, the first one and the most important, um, and I think the most eagerly awaited in the planning community is the infamous planning white paper that we've been expecting for some time now. Um, and this is going to support local areas to plan, it will modernize the planning system, uh, accelerate planning decisions, make it easier for communities to engage and play a role in decisions which affect them. And it's going to be informed by a comprehensive review of what does and does not work currently and set out a detailed vision for what the country's housing and land market should be come 2030, as well as plans for how we will get there. So this all sounds fantastic, um, but when are we going to see it? Um, the time frame is, um, well, uh, to put it lightly, uh, unclear. Um, at first, the paper says we can expect it in spring, but there are obviously uh, hurdles to that now. Um, and it, it, later in the document, it says it's, that the uh, white paper will be published alongside the general spending review. Um, this has been delayed from July due to COVID-19. So I think we'll just have to wait and see when we see when that planning white paper is going to arrive. Um, alongside the planning white paper, we're told that we'll be getting the response to the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission's report and recommendations, which like I said, is quite a key theme running through these reforms. Um, so that's another one to look out for. Then we're also expecting two pieces of legislative reform. Uh, these were both announced in the Queen's speech. Uh, one of these is the Building Safety Bill. This is broader than the Fire Safety Bill that we saw introduced into Parliament in March. Um, and also the Renters Reform Bill, uh, which is the one that's going to be abolishing no-fault evictions and generally trying to make the world a better place for tenants. Um, but we've had no further sign of either of these pieces of legislation so far. Um, then we'll be getting a social housing white paper um, and the aim is that all of these documents by the end of the year um, will all be feeding into an overall housing strategy, uh, setting out longer term plans for delivering homes and creating a fairer housing market. Um, so we're being promised much more detailed thinking um, and a few concrete uh, legislative changes, but it's very unclear when we're going to see them. Um, however, it's not entirely a case of wait and see, and the paper does set out some of its own reforms uh, which I'm going to deal with now. 
broadly under the heading that they're set out in the paper, which is delivering more homes. Uh, this is going to be the focus of uh, the next few minutes of my talk, because I think these are the most interesting reforms. Uh, then looking at some reforms on increasing home ownership, then creating beautiful and sustainable places, and then turning to affordable, safe and secure housing. So in terms of delivering more homes, the government's pledged 10.9 uh, billion pounds of funding. And this they say is to support communities to regenerate brownfield land, invest in new infrastructure, and provide more homes for local people with better access to jobs, schools, and opportunities. And the hope is that this funding is going to help to promote more well-planned development where homes are needed, ensure that communities make land sufficiently available to deliver homes in the right places, deliver on the government's commitment to put infrastructure first, and also speed up the planning system. Um, so I'm going to delve into each of those in a little more detail. Um, so firstly, building more homes. Um, so there's quite a few sort of reforms that go into this. Um, and one of the more concrete ones that we see is this promise to have a national brownfield map, which is supposed to launch this month um, that's looking slightly unlikely now. Um, one can query whether that national brownfield map is going to be much more used than the existing land, brownfield land registers, but um, it's something that the government's putting quite a lot of focus on. They're also investing 400 million pounds into using brownfield more productively by working with ambitious mayors and local leaders. So brownfield is really something that they're emphasizing. Um, and this can also be seen um, in their call for proposals to build above stations. Um, again, this doesn't seem to have been formalized yet, but um, it's an all part of this greater use of previously developed land that's going to be key to driving development and more house building in the future. Um, they're also reviewing the formula for calculating local housing need to encourage greater building within and near to urban areas. Um, but perhaps more interesting to many of you listening are the new proposed permitted development rights. Um, the first of which is to build, is to allow people to build upwards on existing buildings. And this one is to be um, with us apparently by summer 2020. Um, there's been quite a lot of concerns raised in relation to this new right. For example, daylight and sunlight impacts and health and safety and protection of views. Um, but the government has consulted on it and does seem pretty set on bringing it forward. So we're just waiting for more detail really on that one. Um, another key factor here is uh, the Ox another, sorry, another key reform here is uh, the focus on the Oxford Cambridge Arc. So we're going to be looking for more uh, new spatial framework that's going to be coming out showing where the housing and development in that area is going to be delivered um, up to 2050, potentially up to four new development corporations that the government um, is going to be creating, and also a potential new town in Cambridge, uh, which is going to be helping to boost development in that area. There's also quite a couple of slightly vaguer pledges to support those who want to build their own homes, um, to find lots of land to do so. Um, and also we're being promised a consultation on a further PD uh, permitted development right, um, which actually, while it's further back in the stages of, um, of, being, of th in the thinking stages, is actually one that could be very, uh, could prove to be more of a priority as part of the government's economic recovery strategy post COVID-19, because this is the right to build uh, to allow vacant commercial buildings um, and industrial buildings and residential blocks to be demolished and replaced with new residential units. And we could see that in a depressed economy, that could be something that's very important in terms of driving economic recovery. So watch this space on that one. Um, another part of this plan is to make more land available. And this is sort of three key ingredients that hopefully drive and feed into each other. Um, and Simon Gallagher was talking about this yesterday and described as sort of this is taking the existing tools in the planning system and turbocharging them and using them to help drive this greater uh, development and put more building of homes. So these are relatively small changes, but it's hoping that they will feed um, into one another. Uh, the first one is setting a deadline for up-to-date local plans, this time in December 2023. Obviously not hugely new, I think we've heard this before, but um, here's the new deadline. Um, it's slightly undermined by the fact that the, the paper says that government will prepare to intervene where local authorities fail to meet the deadline um, rather than threatening any more concrete action, but we'll, we shall see. Um, they're going to continue with their plan to raise the 
housing delivery test threshold for triggering, triggering the tilted balance. Um, this is what they, they always plan to do. That's going to be 75% from November 2020. Um, and then the hope is that they'll then reward authorities who deliver more through um, changes to the new homes bonus, which they're going to be consulting on um, in spring, allegedly, to incentivize greater delivery and ensure access to greater funding. So we'll see, see what happens and what comes of that. Um, they also are looking to put infrastructure first. Um, this is another important part. Um, these are relatively self-explanatory. It just seems to be a case of putting more money into it. And you've got most of your key information on the screen. Um, effectively 1.1 billion to fund key infrastructure schemes and then another 10 billion to fund the single housing infrastructure fund. Um, now you'll remember at the beginning that um, I told you that they said there was 10.9 billion total budget. So I'm not sure exactly how these numbers add up, but uh, we'll get more details alongside the government's three yearly spending review, uh, which is supposed to be in July, but again, has been delayed currently. So we'll watch this space. Um, Finally, they're looking to accelerate planning, um, a whole host of ways in which they want to do this. They, a lot of the details will be set out in the white paper, but we get a few snippets here. There's going to be a new planning fee structure to ensure that authorities are properly resourced. Um, there's going to be a link to a new performance. This will be linked to a new performance framework. Um, one of the key drivers here is to getting better customer service for those using the planning process. There will then be automatic rebates on application fees where applications are successful on appeal. Um, I'm not sure that developers will be jumping for joy about this given that the application fees aren't exactly a big chunk of the cost of the planning appeal, but there's, you know, we won't sniff at it. Um, and there's also the encouragement of faster build out for housing developments, um, including by requiring more transparency on land options. Um, and the government's going to be trying to seek views on how else to encourage faster build out. Um, another key um, element, element here is to try and provide further support and expertise on the use of compulsory purchase powers. Um, they're going to be consulting on various legislative reforms to speed up that decision making process, um, including imposing statutory timescales, ending the automatic right to public inquiry, encouraging early agreement and remitting more decisions back to local planning authorities. Um, so watch out for that consultation that will be coming up, um, if that's something that is of interest. Um, finally, the government is going to be encouraging greater use of zoning tools, uh, for example, local development orders that try to simplify the plan permission, pro uh, permission granting process. Um, and this could potentially be a sign of a move towards a more zoning based system more generally, but I think we'll have to wait for the white paper to, to see on that. Um, and then, like I said, there are three sort of other key sections to this. Uh, one is increasing home ownership. Um, these are slightly vaguer um, with proposed reforms, but um, the, the main aim is, seems to be to help first time buyers onto the housing ladder um, through firstly a new first home scheme, uh, with the consultation for which is closing on the 1st of May. So if that's something that's of interest, worth um, having a look at that consultation paper. Um, they're also going to be looking to explore encouraging long-term fixed rate mortgages, which is nice and vague. So we'll um, see what, what happens with that. And also they've, the government has recently consulted on a new shared ownership model and that consultation closed on the 29th of September um, last year and views are being analyzed. So we'll see whether any reforms to shared ownership come out of that. So moving on to beautiful and sustainable places, um, three main elements to this. Firstly, the government wants to respond to the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission's report, which was published in January of this year. And they're going to be looking to take forward as many of the Commission's recommendations. Um, although as someone who used to work at the Law Commission, that's a phrase that I'm all too familiar with and doesn't necessarily mean immediate reforms, but hopefully a lot of those recommendations are taken forward. Um, there's also going to be a new model design code and the government will be encouraging local design guides and codes and formed by local people. And the government's also going to keep striving towards this commitment to be net zero by 2050. So that's the sustainability limb of this section, um, including through the future home standard, which will be imposing 80% lower carbon emissions for all new homes in 2025. 
again the responses on that consultation are currently being analysed so we hope to see some recommendations soon. Um, and also there's also the discussion in this paper of a net zero development in Totem in East Midlands so the detail um, is still awaited on that but they'll be exploring options for regeneration in that area. And then finally um, and some relatively significant Oh. I've lost the slides, I'm afraid, so I'm not sure if everyone else can see, so I'll see them. Um, apologies for that. I'm just going to see. Apologies for that. I think the person who was sharing our screen slides has lost internet, so we are just waiting for them to reconnect um, and then we'll continue with the presentation. Um. Um, real apologies for this. We're trying to get back online as soon as possible. Yeah, Kim, it's Sasha here. Um, we've all heard about the, the potential pitfalls of Zoom. We've heard about people photobombing. What we hadn't, I suppose it's inevitable with over a thousand participants that, that something might go glitched. Have you finished? Do you want me to now, shall I start? I had one last section, which I thought, which was just about this insight from MHCLG, which I might be able to do without the slides, if that's, if that's helpful. Well, why don't you? And then I will start mine while we're waiting for Josh to come back. Okay. Um, so as I said, um, yesterday I attended a webinar with, which Simon Gallagher, the director of planning at MHCLG, was discussing this very paper. Um, but obviously there was, actually, there was quite a lot of focus also on the COVID-19 crisis and the emergency measures that MHCLG had taken and will be taking in the near future. Um, so with apologies to anyone who did attend that talk, I thought it might be helpful to just quickly sum up what he said. Um, and firstly, one is that he recognises that, that the planning inspector is a significant priority currently in dealing with the pausing of hearings and inquiries. Um, the case has been made by the planning community that this can be done remotely and they are working closely with PINs to try and remedy that. Um, they're also dealing with a lot of individual issues from local planning authorities at the moment and trying to deal with practicalities around decision making, for example, site notices and how to conduct consultation at this time. Um, he then recognised that the essential role um, development is going to have in the recovery phase um, and that therefore it's essential to get planning able to support the economic, economic recovery, um, looking, for example, at how to prevent planning commissions from lapsing in this in this time, um, but that's quite difficult because of primary legislative reform required. And also practicalities around still payments um, and trying to understand them and how to resolve it. So these are all things that are churning in the MHCLG's mind. Um, we just have to await what they're going to do about them. Um, in terms of planning for the future, he highlighted a, a few key points. So firstly, the importance of making planning more digital and providing better ser customer service. Um, he also, um, suggested that the white paper is not going to be published in the spring because he says it probably wouldn't be appropriate to publish something at this time um, but he's not he wouldn't commit to a new time frame so I think it's really watch the space on the on the white paper that's going to be providing more details on those reforms and then secondly oh we've got the slides back um, so I'm just on this final slide um, and secondly he focused, he emphasised the role of permitted development rights. He recognises they're, they're not popular with everyone, but he thinks that the current system is very much clogged up on little things and therefore the big things don't get focused on enough. And so the, something like a permitted development right, which allows small permissions to be granted quickly and focused to be on the bigger permissions are very important 
part of the, the toolbox that the government's going to be using. Um, and he confirmed that the upwards building planning uh, permitted development right might be delayed by a week or two, but he said no more than that. So summer is still a feasible time frame for that one. Um, he recognised that he also finally recognised that a lot more thinking needs to be done on permission to demolish and rebuild. Um, so this is that second permitted development right they're going to be consulting on, but that could come into its own in a depressed market. So it's something that they're thinking about. Um, so it's really a case of watch this space. Um, thank you very much for listening to that quick run through for planning for the future reform. Apologies for the technological glitch. Um, I hope it's been helpful and feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A tab. I'll try and answer a few at the end. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Sasha White, who is going to be talking about key themes and trends in housing appeals over the past year. Sasha. Thank you very much, Kim. And hopefully I'll remain with slides. <laughs> I did once do a lecture for a major planning consultancy and the slides, there's one of the participants who I know will remember this and the slides went down after two minutes on an hour and a half talk. So hopefully if I have to add lib for 20 minutes, it will be relatively easy compared to then. Uh, now my talk is aiming to deal with the key themes and trends in housing appeals over the past year. And what I've done is I've looked on the website of all the decisions I've spent the past week going through literally 2,600 decisions and what I've focused on is the 196 which have been determined by inquiry. So this is a, an attempt to give you a precy of the 1st of April to the present day. I've sought to provide investigation and identification of the trends and the preference and the focus is very much on residential use because obviously that is a fundamental element of the planning appeal system at the moment and so as I said I've dealt with 196. Now all statistics are that I refer to are government sources I don't want to be Trump like and talk about fake news hopefully our government we can rely on which I think we can and all appeals references you'll be able to find on compass if any are of interest or analogous to situations you're dealing with. References are to the LPA and the date of the decision. If you have any problems finding those decisions, do email me. And if any of you also, I'm very happy to be told I've missed a seminal appeal on an issue um, and I'll add it for future reference. Now, in relation to the key themes I'm going to cover, I set them out and in the interest of the time, I've got 25 themes. I'm gonna get up to key theme 12 today and do the rest next week. So I just thought it would be worth to have a look at the factual position. Let's, what are we talking about in terms of our planning, planning system and applications and appeals? As I said, we've had last year, from the 1st of April of last year to the 1st of April this year, we had just under 2,700 appeals involving residential development. That is in the context of 22,000 determined. So just over 10% clearly involved residential use of which, interestingly, 28% were allowed. So the current rate of residential appeals being allowed is 28%. And then in terms of how those 28% are the, the determination, we can see, as Matt Fraser will talk about next week, the Secretary of State is using his call-in powers much more restrictively than has previously been the case. Only 19 appeals were called in. 196 by inquiry, 401 by hearing, and 2,000, just over 2,000 by written reps. And it's also noteworthy in terms of prospects, if you are a residential developer, you want to go, you actually want your matter to be called in, because the Secretary of State is the most favourable forum, 52% of allowed. Uh, contrastingly, 196 public inquiry residential appeals, only 36% allowed. In terms of hearing, interestingly, we always historically at the planning bar thought hearings were less successful than inquiries, but in terms of residential appeals, we see 1% more, 37% allowed, and then written reps as the worst um, percentage of approvals, 25%. In terms of regional differences, this is quite interesting. You notice the biggest contrast in London, 31% of residential appeals are allowed in the southeast only 23%. And what, what are the appeals actually resulting in? 
Um, well, we know that the inspectorate state that, that 21,000 houses were brought forward by way of appeal um, out of a total of 55,000 that were being appealed. So 38% of the quantum of housing units which were subject to appeal were actually granted. And then we note, of course, that actually in the overall quantum of residential dwellings brought forward last year, it's about 400,000 of which only 21,000 came on appeal. So we can see the actual contribution of appeals to the housing, housing contributions is pretty small. It's just 5%. Then we look at the position in relation to the question of prior to appeal. What are LPAs actually doing on the ground? Is it more likely or less likely to get housing permissions than historically? Planning applications are down 4% on 2018, very small reduction, but it's very interesting, massive reduction since earlier part of this century. In 2004, there were three quarters of a million planning applications. Of that 432, 347 were granted permission. So notwithstanding what is portrayed in the media, the fact is we have a system where 80% of applications are granted consent. And that resulted in 2019 in 370,000 residential units. And just looking at the historic trend, in 2009 only 161,000 houses were granted, as opposed to last year 371, and we see 2018 as high as 383. <clears throat> so the fact is the government's planning reforms are working to the extent there is clearly more consents coming forward. And again, looking at the percentage of 80% granted consent, comparative for major residential development, 79 or 83% was granted consent. So clearly more LPAs are granting permissions for residential use than 10 years ago, and the rate of success has marginally improved with only now 17% of major residential applications being refused. <clears throat> now, is it easy or harder to get permission at appeal? In 2014, 62% of public inquiries ended with the appellant getting consent. 2017, it was 47%, so we do see a reduction in the granting of consents. And then we notice in 2019, as I've said, it's not completely comparative because the first two figures relate to all uses. The 2019 figures relate to residential. And as I've said, 36% of public inquiries led to a grant of consent. 28% of all the appeals dealing with residential granted consent. So the trend is there is a considerable decline in the success rate of appeals for residential use. And while I was writing this webinar, I thought, why? And this is, I'm quite happy to have views, but my view was, and I, this has been a long-standing view, and it's a general criticism, but the reality is that PINS doesn't recruit broadly enough, and particularly from those that have hitherto worked in the private sector. Inspectors, there is a general sense that inspectors don't apply the tilted or even the flat balance correctly in many occasions. LPAs, of course, are getting better and more refined in grounds of objection and interpretation of the MPPF as it becomes of some vintage. Third parties, and this is certainly my view, are unquestionably also getting stronger and more sophisticated in their opposition to development proposals. There has been the emergence of development plans, which has had, in my judgment, a major impact on delivery of housing schemes. And lastly, of course, there has been a, a strong increase in development plans being up to date. So I just now can I deal with looking at some appeals, the key themes that are emerging. What, what, and the first thing I wanted to do isn't about merits, but about the actual me mechanics of appealing, because often I am asked to advise on amendments between the refusal or the appeal for non-determination and the actual appeal, what is the likelihood and the approach of inspectors to such amendments? And of course, just to summarise, the key sources to consider these matters, the starting point is Annex M to the Planning Inspector's Procedural Guidance, which everyone will know is identified with that dark blue cover, which was last updated last month. <clears throat> 
We obviously have the Wheatcroft case that every single planning practitioner knows, but that was refined in 2017 by the Holborn Studios case. And in that, John Howell refined the Wheatcroft judgment to make emphasis on the rights of public are of significant importance. That was obviously a case dealing with re-consultation in the context of an application, but the legal principles are relevant to the consideration of amending appeals. And the question was whether what is proposed, either with the application or at appeal, is substantial or not in substance what was originally applied for. And the question of fairness on reconsultation was of importance as well. Whether not to reconsult would so deprive those who were entitled to be consulted originally an opportunity to make representations considering the nature and extent of changes. Now, many of you will want to know how this is being dealt with on the ground. And I just have two appeal decisions, both of which I was involved on. The first was from last autumn, which was a decision of the 13th of December in Wealdon. This was a proposal for 700 homes. And this is all relates to the context of the highway concern. The Highway Authority East Sussex had a concern that they did not make a consultation response. The appeal was submitted for non-determination, so the appellants had no idea strictly what the Highway Authority's position was. Then once the appeal became inevitable in the inquiry, the Highway Authority made some pretty strong comments on the application, and understandably the appellants sought to amend the scheme. On the morning of the inquiry, having done amendments, the LPA objected on the Wheatcroft grounds that what was proposed by the amended plans was too substantial and the inspector endorsed that. They refused to accept the amendments and then that judgment was reached during the course of the inquiry. The second appeal is a case at Marsh Farm in Royal Wootton Bassett in Wilkshire again dismissed. In that case, the inspector in September 2018 considered the amendment, said that he would like consultation to take place within the authority Wiltshire. That took place, the inquiry recommenced in December and the inspector accepted a change of the scale of reducing the scheme from 320 to 220 dwellings. So of course, most of you would like me to be incredibly prescriptive and say these scenarios all will be accepted and these scenarios won't be. I'm afraid that's completely what I can't do because my judgment is that the approach of the inspectorate and to appeals of amendments is still far too subjective, dependent particularly on the approach of the inspectors. And the nightmare is that this determination doesn't actually take place usually till the first day. So that's the first view in relation to Wheatcroft amendments. The next key theme I want to talk about is housing land supply. And this is probably in the context of residential development, the most important issue and the operation of paragraph 11 in the context of the footnote and also paragraph 59. What happens to determine whether an LPA has a housing land supply? The first case I wanted to take you to was a decision very recent, 18th of March in Torridge, land in Great Torrington. This was a proposal which is often found, which is 181 homes outside settlement boundaries. It was three fields for de development, one of which was allocated and had next stamp permission for 80 houses. In considering housing land supply and torage, the inspector decided that the council could not show a five-year land supply and the tilt of balance was in play and decided that the benefits were not outweighed, not significantly and demonstrably outweighed by the harm. But in that case of relevance, that was a, a classic example of the inspector looking at the new guidance in the MPPG on deliverability and determining that the LPA were seeking to rely on a number of sites which did not meet the updated MPP definition of deliverable. The next case was one in Chichester, again, pretty recent, 2nd of March, 199 dwellings, and the inspector concluded again um, w considered a five-year HLS shortfall and took the view that there wasn't one, interestingly, but the need that was looking over the horizon in the context of a new plan emerging for Chichester, the need was getting significantly greater and that need was such that the LPA should take steps to consider that emerging need 
and granting permission now would not only would not be needed to assist the current development plan but would not effectively cause any prejudice to the improving and increasing requirement that was coming over the horizon so the inspector granted that the third case in its relation to Waverley of September 2019, 53 dwellings, the LPA contended, classic case where an LPA contend there was a five year land supply at 5.2 years, the appellant contended it was only 4.3 years, so the inspector was faced with a determination on whether the five year requirement was met or not. The judgment of the inspector again was looking at specifically and in detail at the LPA's definition of what deliverability actually meant and deliverable meant and there was not an adequate substantive evidence covering issues such as the timing of reserve matters for those sites that had been granted outline consent, the nature of the advance work required to get houses forward and the legal issues to be resolved and in that appeal the inspector clearly determined the LPA did not have a five-year land supply so the point I would make to you where the battleground now sits on the basis of the past year appears to be a real identification of what the MPPG actually means as deliverable and the inspectors concluding on a site-by-site -site basis whether those sites meet the, the new policy. Then the next issue I wanted to talk about is what approach is being taken to the development plan being out of date. As those of you will know who deal with paragraph 11, which Guion has touched on, there are generally two fundamental ways to activate the tilt of balance. The first is the LPA do not have a five year land supply. The second, of course, is whether the development plan is out of date or not. And I'm looking at three appeal decisions where that was addressed. The first in Central Bedfordshire, a proposal for 55. The plan there in central Bedfordshire was more than five years old and based on an out of date housing requirement. So in essence, the inspector did conclude that the, the tilt of balance was operational, but notwithstanding that conclusion, the judgment was reached in that case that the landscape harm was such that it outweighed the benefits of the scheme. The second appeal is another Wokingham one, Hurst, Again, 31st of January, small appeal, five dwellings on a paddock site, but the inspector held, although the housing requirement had increased since the local plan which had been adopted, i.e. the need had increased, it did not necessarily mean, because the policy of concern, CP17, did not have an upper limit, it was not, it had effectively the flexibility and ability to cater for an increased housing requirement, and therefore the basket of policies were not necessarily out of date and therefore the tilt of balance was not engaged. The last decision was Bracknell Forest, which it were, unfortunately the compass didn't say the number, but it was policies relating to the protection of the countryside. There was concluded, and this is often an argument run, that the old policies are not compatible with the MPPF uh, and protection of the countryside not consistent with the latest MPPF three and four of the central policies were out of date, therefore activating the tilt of balance and the considerable benefits were determinative in that case. So in summary, in relation to is the development plan out of date, I think this is probably in the light of housing land supply, the most difficult battleground we're encountering on a day to day basis. And the three fundamental issues are um, if just because one policy appears out of date, it does not mean that an inspector will conclude overall that a policy is out of date or a plan is out of date. Secondly, just because the housing needs has increased, that also does not mean that inspectors will conclude that the policies are out of date. And the third point, even with a conclusion of the policies being out of date and the tilt of balance in play does not preclude the inspector granting weight to those policies and that's one of the distinguishing features I've seen in the appeal decisions still decision makers applying weight to out-of-date policies in the section 38.6 balancing exercise. So the next theme I want to talk about is what weight is being given to the tilt of balance because one of the criticisms particularly from the development industry is that inspectors are not actually giving due weight to a tilt of balance and are not effectively doing what the government's giving them the injunction to do. 
and I just wanted to talk about three cases again. Let's go back to Torrington uh, and that case, and the inspector decided that that was a classic example of the application of the tilted balance, that the harm did not outweigh the benefits. It, but, then, but then let's look at a rather decision, again reasonably recently on the 13th of Feb, 685 houses beyond the settlement boundary. That authority had an acute housing need in the view of the inspector at less than four years from the housing policies and the development plan out of date. <clears throat> Therefore, both routes to the tilted balance were clearly in play in that case. But the harm, therefore, or to landscape character and contrary to development plan boundary was clearly outweighed and the extent of need there was allowed. So the top two are classic tilted balance, yes, decisions. However, you go to a decision of the 16th of December in North Somerset at Elm Grove Nursery, where again, North Somerset were found to have a shortfall and development plan out of route, both routes to the tilted balance in play and significant weight, however, to the harm to a settlement gap policy. And in that judgment, the inspector concluded that harm outweighed significantly and demonstrably the benefits as a whole. So we can see my overall view on these is that we can see, I'm not unsurprising, I'll be very surprised if any listener is, is surprised by this, but clearly there is an inconsistent application of the tilted balance. Then we get to um, the disengagement by footnote six, and Guion has touched on this in his cases, but there, in what circumstances will inspectors disengage the tilted balance because of footnote six, which effectively the closed list of circumstances in which an inspector can decide, he or she can decide to disengage. And there are, there are effectively three cases, appeals I want to talk about, two relate to environmental slash ecological issues and one flooding. In North Somerset, it related to flooding. That was from February of this year. Inspector took the view that where you have a site liable to flooding, footnote six clearly did relate to flooding. It talks about areas at risk to flooding and the sequential approach had not been satisfied. And that provided a clear case for disengaging the tilted balance. You'll recall the decision I looked at on the last slide from North Somerset where an inspector had concluded that they didn't have an HLS and the policies were out of date. But notwithstanding that, in this case, the inspector goes next stage and disengages the tilted balance due to flooding and refuse the scheme. In Grange Road, Lawford, in tendering a decision of October of last year, 110 houses left. The site lies close to an estuary, which was an SBA and Ramsar site and an SSSI. The inspector concluded significant potential harm to European sites and again used footnote six and took the view that the overall harm on a flat balance outweighed the benefits. And the last case on relation to this is a case at tendering for a redevelopment of a, a hotel, what well, a proposal for 200 homes to assist the regeneration of an existing hotel. And the inspector felt the proposal would again also have an impact on the nearby European designated site and the tilt of balance could not apply because of the footnote six uh, and notwithstanding the shortfall in the housing land supply in the area. So these three cases provide clear evidence where inspectors are using and utilising the tilted balance to be disengaged because of footnote six. So now moving on to the next key theme, and just wait for the, what is the effect of the use of the flat balance? And I've dealt with the tilted, let's talk about the flat balance. Um, and what we get there is effectively, first case is Crawley, 185 dwellings on a site allocated for 75. LPA could demonstrate potentially nine years HLS, but some of its needs were met by joining authority. In that case, flat balance granting consent would be sustainable and housing delivery was acceptable through the plan period. But then we look at the other approach, one in Charmwood last September for 226 houses. There the LPA could show a five year housing land supply and the overall development plan basket policies not out of date. And it was a flat balance. And then that judgment and that finding the inspector concluded that the harm could not 
was not outweighed by the benefits. There was a conflict with the development plan and the inspector placed significant weight on the importance of a plan-led system. In Stowe Market of last year in Mid-Suffolk, decision of the 13th of August, 160 homes on the outskirts of Stowe Market. Again, flat balance because the LPA could show five year HLS and the development plan was partly up to date. And the impact on a heritage asset, a church, was of such weight that it provided clear justification for refusing the application under MPPF 196. So last two key themes that I want to deal with today. The next one is in relation to, let me just get it up. Oops, I'm now lost, <laughs> lost the, I'll just carry on talking. I don't know why we've gone down for the second time, but I'll just, talk what I was going to then talk about was about the housing what weight has been given to affordable housing in the balancing exercise and that's often a case I know some developers and numerous developers including myself when I'm representing appellants think it is worthwhile and necessary to have a specific consultant dealing with affordable housing need because generally very few authorities can show that they're fully meeting the requirements and also it's right that inspectors generally give a pretty strong weighting to affordable housing. So, and just for those that we now have it back. Uh, there we are. I'm going to touch on Lambeth. And the first case I'm going to talk about is in Lambeth. This was a, uh, for a large development, large high development. Cornwall Road, proposal for 215 dwellings, all for 100% rent, although not discounted rent target. Uh, uh, and in that case, it was the concluded by the inspector that the maximum reasonable amount of affordable housing that could be made available was being provided there. And the inspector took into account viability evidence and gave weight to the affordable housing in the overall balancing exercise although the affordable rent was well below the policy target of 40 percent so that's a that's one of those cases where i would say the affordable housing provision was pretty powerful the next case is in relation to haringey and that was dismissed because what was proposed there was a hundred percent affordable housing scheme for 44 units but they were for single occupancy flats intermediate discounted market sales LPA policy in Haringey sought a mix of 10 years and dwelling sizes and the inspector concluded the exclusion of other categories of affordable housing such as affordable rented and the fact that it was only one tenure i.e single occupancy weighed significantly the, against the proposal and the inspector even acknowledged in the decision notice although it was unusual to reject 100% affordable housing schemes the appeal was refused. Uh, and then the other one I wanted to talk about was in relation to Charwell, a case in, of 84 dwellings, which the, the inspector concluded called limited harm to heritage assets. And that is a classic case where the inspector gives very significant weight for the affordable housing in a district where house prices were 11 times earnings in Charwell. So in that case, the, I think what I would say about affordable housing, it's quite clear that inspectors do give very significant weight to the provision of affordable housing generally, whether it be in the flat or the tilted balance. So then finally, I'm going to deal with prematurity because this is one of those tricky areas dealt with by MPPF 49 and 50. And often the case is how much weight do inspectors, do inspectors give to plans that are yet to be adopted? And we, as I say, we need to look at 48 to 50. First cases in Wah, where 66 houses were dismissed on the edge of a settlement there, formed part of a wider allocation, but the inspector dismissed the appeal because in that case, what the policy and the extant policy required a master plan, and the inspector couldn't be satisfied that if allowing 66 of the 400, without a master plan, whether there would be prejudice to the wider um, development of the site. The next appeal in tendering is a classic um, 
classic development on the edge of open countryside, site outside the boundaries of the emerging plan, but that plan had unresolved objections and therefore was allowed because only limited weight could be applied to the position of the LPA. And then the last one, Nail C, is quite helpful because it particularly deals with whether the proposal is so substantial as referred to in 49A of the MPPF. And in that case, 280 dwellings were proposed on the south of the site, but, but the inspector rejected that a proposal of the quantum of 280 units was not so significant as to justify an allegation of prematurity in the context of MPPF 49. So that, that is, concludes part one of my, of my speech and I will finish it off at the same time next week. So please do sign in to come. We're now going to end the webinar with basically all three of us answering some questions and we will start off with, with effectively, um, Guion has got, so I've noticed guion has got some very interesting questions and we'll deal with him first. Guion, if you could just talk about two or three of the most interesting questions that you've had up, then Kim will do the same and then I'll do the same. Certainly, Sasha, very happy to uh, answer uh, those questions and thank you for so many of them. We've received almost 40 uh, in total uh, and if I just pick out a couple uh, which struck me as potentially relevant to uh, quite a few of us. What about this question? If paragraph 11d of the framework is engaged and Lim one captures the proposal, uh, so for example there's uh, the question of heritage impact, and the proposal survives the heritage test, um, that's the, the mini balance, uh, when you balance the, the, let's say, the less than substantial harm against the public benefits. If the proposal survives that first test, could the second limb of paragraph 11D still be engaged? And the answer to that is, is yes, uh, because those two limbs are alternative grounds for disapplying the presumption in favour of uh, granting uh, permission. If you remember, um, I said in my presentation, the key word there is or, O-R. They are alternative grounds. So it's perfectly feasible that a proposal could survive, let's say, that mini heritage balance under the first limb. But there are other considerations in the wider planning balance that when it comes on to carrying out that tilted balance, uh, that mean that uh, there is an alternative basis, as I say, for disapplying the uh, presumption. Uh, this other question, I think, struck me as, as uh, a good one to be asked, because it is actually one that I've been asked quite a few times in practice, and that's in relation to Section 73. And it comes down really to this hassle factor of copying and pasting planning conditions for subsequent um, Section 73 applications. And the question I'm asked is, would it be OK for a local planning authority to, to issue a consent that simply said, all conditions on the previous consent still apply, apart from, of course, the condition the application is seeking to lift or to vary. Now, you might say that the Lambeth judgment gives you a little bit more leeway with that sort of approach if we are ultimately asking what the reasonable reader would, would make of it all. But I would really say, why would you take that risk? Because a decision on a Section 73 application being in substance a new planning condition should really be self-contained. And I think where the real legal risk um, comes is if you've got, as let's be honest, you know, quite regularly happens, you've got multiple Section 73 applications in a planning history that are potentially referencing on that approach different consents for a site. If I had the uh, the, the time to pick uh, uh, an 11th case for you this morning. It probably would have been another Welsh case that I did. The case of Hillside Parks and Snowdonia National Park Authority, where there was an extremely complicated planning history, all sorts of uh, fresh applications, Section 73 applications being made over the course of about 50 years. And that case is a real lesson in how real problems can arise and uncertainties can arise if you've got planning permissions and decision notices that are cross-referencing each other in a pretty messy, sometimes clumsy way, which makes it quite difficult to really understand what was decided at a particular point in time. So my advice would be, cumbersome though it is, uh, 
that the best practice when dealing with Section 73 applications really is to carry over the conditions from the uh, original permission to the decision notice, because then there's no question at all then, there's no debate that can be had as to what exactly are the conditions to which that subsequent permission granted pursuant uh, uh, to Section 73, what those conditions really are. Um, that I think deals with uh, two of the most practical questions that I was asked. I'll of course deal with any others in writing after the uh, the webinar, but uh, why don't I hand over to Kim and Kim can deal with uh, some questions that she's been asked. Thanks very much, Guion. Um, we had one question about the increased usage of the LDO process for zoning um, and how is that likely to progress when compared to encouraging um, swift and refreshed local plans. Um, and I think basically this shows the two key limbs of a government strategy in terms of reform. And one is turbocharging the existing tools that we already have. So making sure local plans are up to date, making sure local planning authorities are making land available and delivering on housing. But the second limb, the sort of second prong of attack, I suppose, is to enable more development to go forward through a simplified permission process. Um, i.e. through permitted development rights or local development orders. Um, and another key part of local development orders um, is they see them as being very important to the new free ports that the government is trying to bring forward. That's probably a talk for another day, but there's a big consultation going on on that at the moment and how local development orders can be used to bring forward these free ports in the same way they were used for sort of enterprise zones. Um, so that's kind of how those two fit together um, in my view. Um, there was also another question around this new performance framework and better customer service and what do we think that the government means by that and um, unfortunately there isn't really any more detail provided. Uh, they just say that the new performance framework will ensure performance improvements across the planning service for all users. Um, we're not sure how um, and it just seems that customer service is quite a big priority for Simon Gallagher um, and MHCLG generally so hopefully we will see something that's relatively robust but there's just no detail provided. Um, and then finally, a question about how local is housing for local people. Um, again, I'm afraid the answer is we, don't, we just don't know. Um, it depends slightly on the context. There's definitely been talk about um, design um, and this envisagement of local design guides and codes being embedded into planning policy. So that could be either at an LPA level or at parish council level. Uh, there's when it comes to support for the community and self-build, that seems to stem from individuals who want land to self-build to parish councils and neighbourhood forums. So that's probably the most local level. Um, and then some talk about the ho first home scheme being giving priority to local people, but again, not clear how that will be defined. Um, that's, that's part of a consultation that's ongoing at the moment. So something to feed into if it's of importance to you. Um, I'll hand over to Sasha, I think, um, deal with any other questions in writing after. Thank you very much, Kim. I'm just going to touch briefly in view <coughs> of the time on four matters that have been raised. First of all, a point is made about the subjectivity of the inspectors, which I commented on, and it is true, there is a subjectivity because that PIMS used to very helpfully publish each inspector's success and failure rate in terms of those grants. And I can remember doing an appeal in 2015 actually one of the participants was my instructing planner and we found out that our inspector had a 96 percent refusal rate so as you can imagine we didn't go into that inquiry um full of hope and surprise surprise the the refusal rate was reinforced by her her view in our decision so there are significant variations in inspectors or there were when the when the appeal decisions were published of those granted and those refused I've also, there was a point about the tilt of balance saying, well, of course, it's the application is different because it is subjective. It requires a weighting. I think that's absolutely fair and right. What my criticism would be is for those practitioners, all of us, whatever our perspective or viewpoint, have to reach judgments on what is likely to happen and what you do now, particularly in relation to landscape, heritage and, and other site specific topics. It is very difficult to reach a view on what weighting will be applied because of the variations in, in approach. And the one criticism I would make quite strongly of the MPPF is that there is a lack of forensic indication as to what weight various topics 
will be given in a balancing exercise because significantly and demonstrably, to my mind, on the face of it, sounds that you need something pretty heavy, pretty weighty to dislodge the presumption. In reality, if an inspector cannot like a particular element, notwithstanding 10 or 12 benefits, that can, that one one impact can often outweigh, can significantly and demonstrably outweigh. So that is a problem. The next issue, which is about Wheatcroft, what I would do if I had, an, had a voice in this is I think it would be worth having some form of me a formal mechanism under Rosewell for Wheatcroft amendments to be dealt with, to be suggested, considered, and then determined well before the, the appeal so everyone knows where they stand and you don't have the lottery of the first day at a hearing or at an inquiry of not knowing whether the inspector will accept them or not at, on, the, on effectively in the actual tribunal. The last point was an interesting point, which is true, is, and it touches on Kim's lecture, is, is the fact is that the, appeal, the application system with 80% of, of proposals getting approval, the vast majority of proposals are approved and we obviously always do focus on the tension of refusal but I think that the outtake from my my lecture is that unquestionably the planning system is working far better than it gets credit for particularly by many politicians who comment on it so in the light of that can I ask you all can I say thank you on behalf of Kim and Guion can I thank everybody for joining us today it's been really interesting. I'm sorry about the glitch, but it wouldn't be it, it, probably inevitable that there will be some form of glitch. At least we haven't been photobombed by something inappropriate or, or had too many participants who should have been joining a separate Zoom on, on yoga in the sun or something of that nature. Um, but I'm delighted you joined us. Please come and join us next week where I will be talking again to finishing off my lecture and Zach Simons and Matthew Fraser will also be speaking. We will endeavour to answer all the questions we've been sent to which we haven't answered today. Everyone will also get sent the link you will, which will give you an opportunity to see the slides and you can refer to them and also you can watch a recording afterwards again if there are any particular points you want to have repeated. So on behalf of the three of us and Landmark Chambers, thank you very much for joining. And that is the end of part one of this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. And